Mayor Boris Johnson, Mayor Michael Bloomberg, thank you. Both of you are hosting us, for which thank you. Great. Yes, muss your hair up, exactly like you said to do. Thank you, thank you. I believe in following, I believe in following Mike's, Mike's instructions to the letter. <laughs> All right, good, good, good. Um, speaking of following Michael, uh, London has become a tech community the way um, uh, Silicon Alley in New York has. Short itch has exploded. Explain how you uh, sort of built a tech world here. I, I want to assure you it's been a most extraordinary success, but it's been absolutely nothing to do with me, and I, although I claim credit for it repeatedly. Well, let's go. Uh, it, 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 uh, it's, it really started off about five or six years ago. You've now got a, uh, an incredible growth in tech in London. I think of the last, of the 40 European companies that have are worth more than a billion dollars, 40 in the last 10 years, 17 of them have been British, and 13 of them have been created here in this city. And you've now got, uh, I think, something like 700,000 people working in the sector, 90,000 businesses of one kind or another. It's, it's, it's grown at a most extraordinary rate. And people talk about the rebalancing of the London economy. That certainly is happening in the sense that it's not that financial services are necessarily diminishing, but tech is sprouting. That's, that's fintech, biotech, edtech, medtech, green tech, nanotech. Tech, what did you have to do? Every single, uh, well, I think he just had to make London a more livable. What these guys want is they want a uh, place that's uh, dynamic and cool and, and happening and trendy. And I think the worst thing I could possibly do is try to make any of that. I, mean, I think, obviously, the vibe of London is something that possibly thrives without the interference of politicians. Now, I've seen something called a tech map where you actually... Plan yeah, you're right. Sorry, you're very kind. You're prompting. That was the news story I was meant to tell you. Uh, that's, that's exactly... <laughs> Thank you very much the, for getting me to the point. Uh, the, the, there's, a, there's a tech map that we've got which shows the... Uh, there it is. There's something you can possibly see it on your screens that shows where these things are, are happening and uh, the areas that they're sprouting up like dragon's teeth. And it's not just in, in Shoreditch and Hackney, though those are very uh, fertile areas. You're starting to see tech uh, across London in, in Croydon, in, uh, in the Olympic Park, across, across the city. You're seeing tech starting. And uh, if you want to know where a useful place to start your company, look at, look at the tech map London. How did it work in New York? You, bo you got an engineering school, which is the one piece that New York was missing. Yeah, Bob Steele came up with this idea of seeing if any of uh, the uh, engineering schools around the country wanted to open in New York City. We had available a big piece of land on the, an island in the East River, and there were 25 of the great universities in America that came to the competition. Cornell won the competition. They're building four buildings. I flew over them the other day. The foundation's in the ground. The steel's starting to go up. They've raised something like $700 million privately to fund them. But also, because of them, uh, Columbia University, which is in up, uh, further up north in uh, Manhattan, uh, built a whole new engineering campus, which is almost done. NYU has built a whole new engineering campus, joint with Poly over on the uh, west side on, in Brooklyn. Um, Carnegie Mellon has taken over a bunch of space to do technology for the film industry down the Brooklyn Navy Yard. Uh, Cornell brought in Technion from Israel to help them. But I was listening, thinking when Boris talked about it, yeah, he's right. You have to be family friendly if you're going to really grow. You can have one company any place, but if you're going to attract people from around the world, family friendly is one thing because if it's not, nobody's going to move there. And then number two, you have to be English speaking if you're really going to grow, because it is the business language and the tech language of the world, whether the French like it or not, it just is. But the third thing you have to have, and America has had, I've tried to understand why, while there are a lot of tech companies, why are more companies coming out of America, although it is starting, Boris is right, to come out of London, but it is a mindset. The mindset in America is basically if you try and you fail and you try again, you fail. You know, your family brags about Joe. He's our son, Joe. He started three businesses already. He's on his fourth business. Elsewhere, they would call you a failure. But you and know, you the, uh, New York and London both had the greatest financial communities of the world, but not very good venture capital when it came to those failures. How do you yeah, but I think that? that's changing. If you take a look, Boris mentioned uh, biotech. Uh, New York is, City has always been the, the, bi the, the tech capital of America. It's just been biotech, not 
Facebook and Google and that sort of thing from Silicon Valley. But even if you look Silicon Valley, companies are moving up to San Francisco or to other places. Bloomberg opened an office in San Francisco because our uh, data processing people said, well, there are all these engineers out there coming out of Stanford and we want to be able to attract them and they might not want to live out there. While we were doing it and we opened a small office to hold 30 or 40 programmers, Google bought two whole buildings in New York. They have 6,000 people in New York already. That tells you when people vote with their feet, that's what matters. I don't care what people say when they're giving an interview about promoting their local economy, their local company or anything. The real world is you go to a place like New York, why, or even to San Francisco or to London, they're cosmopolitan, number one, and if you're going to build, pro if you're going to build products for the world, you've got to know what the world looks like. If you're sitting someplace where there's nothing to do other than play, uh, lift weights or run, ride your bicycle and play golf, it's hard to understand how the rest of the world functions. And London, like New York, are big, family-friendly, English-speaking, diverse um, uh, cities. And, but the other thing that is key is this, if you fail, it's not a stigma. You can come back and do it again. And that's typically not the European way, although it is changing. But I think it explains why more new companies are started in America than any place else. Our danger is that as they learn how to do it and change their uh, focus and let people experiment more and come back for a second, third, fourth bite of the apple, then it's going to be more competition. Do you see States. London as a big competitor to New York now? I don't know competitor, but I think an equal. The world financial business is going to be split between New York and London. Neither is going to take away the others, but also they're not going to lose it to any place else in the world. Other places will develop, and there'll be uh, more uh, uh, cross-pollinization and that sort of thing. But the headquarters, even if the title on the door is someplace else, always going to be in one of these two cities. And the same thing is true for tech. I think my, Mike's characterization of the things that our cities have in common is absolutely right. I would point out that the, the crime rate is obviously considerably lower here in, in, in London. The, the mur you're much less, likely, yeah, because much, less likely, much less likely to be murdered. Which is, and Mike is right about that. Much less likely to be murdered here in London than you are in New York. As, as Mike has pointed out many times, that is because of your, your gun control policy about which uh, I know that uh, Mayor Bloomberg has strong views. Uh, but I, I but, might but point out that I, I, Boris was born in New York. Let's I not was, forget I, about I, this. You were born in Boston, by the way. I was, I was. <laughs> Nothing, nothing, but, nothing but, wrong with that. But Boston is where Edinburgh. you start. The first time you invaded us back in 1776, it was there. I, I, I know, I know, and it was it was about it was about taxation, as I seem to remember. A point that, <laughs> a, a point that, a point. America now and exercises in reverse taxing people in this country, even though they haven't lived in America for 45 ah, years. Wait, that's never backstory mind. here. No, 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 he's no, not getting away with it. Never mind that. We never, have a minor problem with never Boris mind. Boris Johnson. It turns out that in America, we tax you no matter tax where you, you make your money if you're a citizen. I think Boris was very point. proud of all right, that, 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 that innovation. Yeah. In all London. of a sudden, I, I, look, you, you, Mike made a very important point about the about the huge range of communities that you have, both in New York and in London. Three hundred languages spoken in in my city. Uh, the same thing, sort of thing. How many by you? And, and <laughs> not not that many. Uh, and <laughs> and uh, it, it, so both New York and London draw people in, fantastic poles of attraction, magnets for, for talent. But the challenge, I think, for, for both of us is how to make sure that the kids growing up in London who are born here actually get involved in those industries. And one of the things that we've been doing, I don't know how much you've been doing in New York as well, is, is trying to get coding right up the agenda in our school so that they, uh, kids understand this very crunchy mathematical stuff they've got to do if they're going to succeed in this, in this industry. And on the, on the point you make about um, failure, which is very important. I mean, I'm a conservative politician. We know all about failure. And uh, we go on and on failing until we, until we, until we succeed. Uh, the, the other thing I think they have in America, which we don't have in, in Britain, is I think a lack of embarrassment about accumulating simply titanic sums of money. And that's a great thing. Which we, I'm in favor of it. Uh, well, exactly. I mean, and, and we, we do, there's a sort of, there's a, there's a problem in the British psyche still about that. And a, and a Wait, kind of, and a, and a willingness to, to, to sort of, to fire arrow, you know, to pellets and projectiles at people, not always to hit them. Let, uh, let me hit that seriously for a second, though. Do you think the growing inequality of wealth might hurt innovation in the city? 
No, no. I think that uh, innovation in this city is, is, is set fair, but I think there is, uh, there is a question about growing inequality of wealth. And if you look at the multiple of earnings in, in, in London, uh, the, between the, the FTSE 100 uh, chief executives and their, the average pay of their, uh, their employees, it has greatly increased in the last 40 years. There's, no, there's no, no question about it. I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing, provided those guys all pay their taxes and pay their people properly and, the, and that there's opportunity. That's to get back to my point about coding. There's got to be opportunity. People have got a sense that this incredible thing that's happening on their doorstep, this bustling, jiving atmosphere of people doing tech startups with, with nose rings and, and, and fixed wheel bicycles and all that, that they have a part in it, that it's going to deliver prosperity for them too. One thing you said just a moment ago when that picking up on something Mayor Bloomberg had said is that the ethnic diversity of both New York and London is a competitive advantage. What are you doing to make sure that you protect the idea of ethnic diversity and you've had a lot of problems now with extremism that you've been dealing with and trying to make sure that people from the Muslim community feel that they're part of the mainstream? The, the, the crucial thing for me is that everybody has to speak English. And I, I think Mike mentioned that, and that's absolutely central to our identity and to our culture. And for my money, it's a form of oppression if people who've lived here for decades are actually unable to speak English and to participate in the economy. So that's the, the number one thing. I find that most people, actually, when they come here, desperately want to belong and to understand this country and its culture and its, and its history. And we, should, we shouldn't be shy, we shouldn't be embarrassed about teaching that in our schools and pushing that up the agenda. And, and I mean, I think one of, one of the wonderful things about America, and the reason it has this incredible success, a pluribus unum, is because in your schools, everybody pledges allegiance to the flag, I think, still. Is that right? Yep. And there's a sense of wherever you've come from, whatever your previous identity was, you have become American. You've become part of that strong, charismatic political identity. And I think we're getting there in this country, but there was a long period in the, in the 70s and, and 80s when we kind of let all that go, and we had a multicultural agenda. Uh, uh, Mayor Bloomberg, you mentioned a moment ago the uh, climate change being the dominant thing. You've created a compact of cities right before the Paris event. Why do you feel that the city should take the leadership role in this? Well, most pollution in the world comes from cities. Keep in mind, 50% of all the people in the world live in cities. By the year 2050, it's projected to grow to 70%. Uh, they're going to be concentrated in the bigger cities. The dirty little secret of moving to cities is they don't move to all the cities. So you see smaller cities who don't have critical mass or any a particular natural phenomenon, a, a great tourist attraction or something. Those cities are in real trouble, and I don't know how they get themselves out of it because when people want to go, they want to go where it's diverse and where it's exciting and where there's lots of opportunities and that sort of thing. But half the people live in the cities, most of the pollution comes from the cities, and the mayors are unique because they deal with the things that cause the pollution. Um, how you dispose of garbage is one of the things. Uh, traffic uh, it, and the pollution from cars just idling. Uh, or just using electricity, even though the pollution may be generated hundreds of miles away where the power plant is, the power gets used in the cities. So if you could reduce the amount of power used in the cities, you would reduce the amount of carbon going into the air. And, and, and so it's the federal government's don't have the direct connection. The state governments don't have direct connections. The mayors, they're held responsible if your kid goes to the hospital with an asthma attack. They're held responsible if the air is filthy and the tourists won't come there. I had a discussion with Modi twice now, two years in a row, who's really trying, he's got a very tough job. India is an enormous country. It's going to be the biggest country in the world in another 10 years. They and China together are a third of the world's population. The air in Delhi is much worse than Beijing. And he keeps saying he's got to fix the economy before he can focus on the environmental stuff. And I've tried to convince him, if you don't fix the environmental stuff, you're not going to have an economy. People aren't going to go there. People aren't going to live long enough to, to, to do things. And so climate change is something that I think we should focus on, not of what happens 50 years, 
now, what you have to focus on right now. Climate change is public health and environmental issues for you and your kids and your grandkids. You don't have to worry about further than that. If you do something for yourself and your family, you will do what we need to stop climate change from making this world a barren planet. Uh, uh, Mike, the, the point, uh, I want to thank, by the way, I should, I should say how much every current mayor, I know there are a lot of mayors here today, owes to, owe to, to you for what you've done, the leadership you've shown, uh, not just with the, the City Lab, but the way you've tried to bring cities together and to get them to focus on issues that uh, we all have in common. And uh, you're, you're still running the C40? You, yep. You're still uh, well, um, Paez from Rio is the chairman and I'm the president. Mike's the, the president of the C40, which is an institution that brings cities together to try collectively to address these problems by public purchase policies, for instance, over whatever it happens to be, hybrid buses or low-energy light bulbs that can drive down costs and improve the environment. And I think that is a, a real opportunity for cities to work together. And uh, here in London, you know, air quality has been a massive, massive issue for us, for, uh, for our people, and it has been improving, contrary to what you might see on the, on the, on the TV. Uh, air quality in London over the last seven and a half years, to pick a period entirely at random, has uh, radically improved, uh, knocks down by 20%, PM10, PM2.5 down by uh, 15%. The air now, at, uh, you know, is so sometimes in London, it is cleaner than the air in Norfolk when they have particularly bad and air quality in Norfolk. Other than Boris Bikes, uh, other than Boris Bikes, wh what, is, uh, what is accounted for that? Uh, it's, it's technology, and it's uh, retrofitting boilers who are a prodigious emitter. Old boilers are prodigious emitters of, of NOx. Uh, it is getting a, a cleaner bus fleet. We've got a cleaner bus fleet. We've got cleaner taxis. By 2018, we're going to have an ultra... Uh, by, we're going to have uh, no... Uh, taxi will be allowed on the street, no new taxi will be allowed on the streets of London unless it is zero emission capable. By 2020, we will have an ultra-low emission zone in the center of town, which you won't be able to drive through in a, a new vehicle unless it is also uh, zero emission capable. So we're really driving, driving the, uh, the pollution down with, with technology. Cycling's a, a tiny, tiny fraction of that, but it's, you know, it's, it's culturally important. And you actually picked up the cycling idea a bit from the Boris bikes, is that right? We stole it from, I have to admit, we stole it from, from Paris. But they stole it from, from Lyon, and Lyon, Lyon stole it from Barcelona. And, and anyway, it all originated in London anyway. Which does ago. mean that we should all um, steal ideas for urban innovation, which is what this yeah, is about. Yeah, I mean, about. look, n nobody has an original idea. Everybody has something in their background, something they heard, something that... that uh, they saw that gives them the idea to take it to a different level or make it more prominent or ch apply it in ways that it hadn't been applied before. All cities have fundamentally the same problem, whether they have a budget like New York's of 70, 80 billion dollars or they have a budget of a few hundred thousand. People want services, nobody wants to pay for them. They'll never say good things. You can always find somebody that says bad things about something and that's what the papers write. And so the mayors have to fight themselves through that and good mayors do and in the end get rewarded the public looks back and says they did a good job one of the nicest things that ever happened to me I chair the World Trade Center Museum and there is a woman who had a relative died on 9-11 and she fought us for years every single thing we ever did was wrong I put her on the board of the foundation everything was wrong it was a disaster we were the worst people in the world and then about a year later a year ago, she came up to me at a board meeting in front of a bunch of people and said, I just want you to know, I said, and I thought everything you ever did was wrong. I was wrong 100% of the time. She said, you were right. This turned out spectacularly. And so, you know, I don't remember the grief that came and gone, but I do remember when the end you won. The, and a, a very good friend of yours who wrote one of the nastiest letters, when we put a smoking ban in his letter to the, the publisher's letter, you can, I don't, would never mention Graydon's name. <laughs> and then, you know, a few years later, he writes this piece, You Saved My Life. So, you know, was it worth the aggravation? Uh, that's an, that's an, an example of your leadership there, Mike, because if I, if, I'm, if I remember correctly, it was you who instituted that smoking ban 
And you first. put it up here. And, and then, of course, it came in in this country, and it's made a huge difference. Yeah, but the good the, news is all of Western Europe, all of South America, virtually all the United States, parts of uh, even of Asia, China just put in, they announced they're closing four coal-fired power plants in Beijing. They put a smoking ban in, even though they own the cigarette companies. That's the good news. The bad news is this year, tobacco companies will sell more cigarettes than ever before in history after all of that because they sell them to the poor, the people who don't understand what's happening to their health. It's all targeted to the poor. And someday, somebody's going to got to come along and say to the people who run those companies, you are killing people. If you kill people on the streets with a gun or, or beat them over the head, we put you in jail or worse. And these people deliberately go out every day and try to kill, for their own profits, the poor around the world. And a billion people, in spite of all our efforts, a billion people will still die from smoking this century. I'd like to ask Mike a bit about obesity, which is an even bigger killer. Uh, in, or in, in, yeah, thank you. Next uh, thing, and if you the, go, the, go the, to a favela in uh, Brazil, go to a township in uh, uh, South Africa, and all these little stores in the middle of these townships, which is really the poorest of the poor, you'll see a red sign from a full sugar drink company, and they sell it. We did get in Mexico, where a foundation gave some money to some groups that managed to get a law passed, putting, I think it was a 10% tax on full sugar drinks and an 8% tax on fast foods, or maybe the reverse, and that really has brought down the consumption. Mexico is the most obese country in the world. And one of the ways you can solve the problem is make it more expensive. What Coca-Cola did is they priced their Coca-Cola cheaper than bottled water. And in Mexico, the public water supply is not very good, so most people drink bottled water. So people are drinking two or three 32-ounce bottles of Coke every day. Number one, you're going to get obese and you come down with diabetes. Number two, there's a lot of evidence that high sh a lot of sugar causes cancer a number of different kinds of cancer. It's not been totally proven yet, but there's a lot of correlations between the two. In one 12 ounce can of Coke, there's enough sugar. If you take that sugar and you put it in your teacup, you could not dissolve it. It saturates. But, but Mike, when you tried to ban, I remember coming to see you once. We, we had a great time. I think, we, and, and we, you, tried, you were in the process of trying to ban drinks. No, we didn't try to ban. What we tried to do was size. Si size. So yeah. you'd have to take two cups and you wouldn't take two. And we won that. The court stopped it. But we won. Take a look at the sales of Coca-Cola Coca Coca and Pepsi are down 20, 30 percent all in the last people couple of years. People quit selling people, the big drinks because yes. they just were People stopped drinking and people stopped ordering them. Even That's very, that, is very, that is very interesting because I think, uh, unless I miss my guess, I think London kids are now, I mean, I don't know whether we're fatter than New York kids, but I, I, I think we are in danger of being fatter than... And, 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 and it's once again kids. another thing. And it's a real, real crisis. We've and it's got another kids. public health thing that's correlated with economics. It's in the poorer neighborhoods, the kids are fatter, the adults are more obese than in the wealthier neighborhoods. Now, and the difference really is not the amount of money you have, it's the likelihood that in wealthier neighborhoods you're going to be better educated. And but it's also the proximity, I mean, your point about the, about the big full sugar drinks is, is very good. It's the proximity of the stuff that's going to, going to, going to do you harm, like these fast food outlets and, and one of the things we're doing is changing the, the planning rules in London so it's much easier for local authorities to stop chicken shacks. Let me get chicken. back if I may to innovation uh, and the problems. Sorry, we wandered off the point. Uh, yeah. w one of the um, issues you've dealt with and we're dealing with in City Lab at the Aspen Institute is the clash between innovators and regulators, municipal regulators. You're threading the needle on Uber. You've kind Uber. of been in favor but now you've got some problems. Explain I how you're threading the needle. I'm, I'm striking a, a balance. What we've got is a, a law that is archaic and is not uh, fit for a world in which you can hail a minicab without the minicab even seeing you. And you can just push a button on your Uber app and the thing can slink from around the corner where it's parked up on a, on a petrol station or wherever it happens to be or a, or a supermarket car park or just in the middle of the street and you've got it, and you can do it, and it, it's there in minutes. Now that, it, to my mind, is as good as hailing it and seeing it. However, of course, that's not what the law says. The law says in order to hail a, a cab, you've got to stand out in the street and, and, and see it. So the, the fundamental distinction between a black cab and a minicab, 
which Uber is Uber being the mini cab. The mini cabs. Uh, Uber is a, 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 an app that allows mini cabs to operate. Yeah, no, yeah, uh, I just uh, want uh, people yeah. here to know you're The, the fundamental Uber. distinction has been obliterated by technology. But why and is that a bad thing? Because it's unfair on the black cabs who have consecrated their lives to the study of routes and have special vehicles and uh, who, uh, in return for that very great expenditure they have made on their vehicles, have been told that they and they alone will be able to ply for hire so it's a question in the streets of fairness and, for the cab and, and, driver, and to be held. Not for the... And so, so, so the question is, how do you strike a balance which... which respects what's happened to the cab drivers, tries to help them where you can, but also reflects the fact that technology is out there. It's changed. You know, though you can't put the genie back in the bottle. People want Uber. I think there are more than a million users of Uber here in, here in London. I'm uh, Hands up in this audience who's got an Uber app on there. Yeah, there you go. Look at this tech, absolutely tech crazy audience. Uh, and not, not surprising. Now, but but uh, Michael, you did not sit there and say, let me protect the poor medallion owners. You said, look, we've well, got look, to I, innovate. I'm not there at the moment to f have the Uber battle. It's, uh, my successor uh, yeah, it has gives you the freedom to say what you want, by the way. But, uh, that's what but, I'm but asking. There's <laughs> no industry that I know that isn't having a disruptive technology coming along. And yes, you have to feel sorry for in New York, the medallion owners with medallions, a license that you have. Although I don't know of any other place where you sell, give somebody a license and then they own it and they can trade it. It's a city license and somebody else is, is making money off it. That doesn't make any sense. But if you take a look, East Eastman Kodak, out of business. I mean, there are lots of these companies that overnight are going out of business because there's a new technology. And the question is, are you there to work for the consumer yeah, the, or should the, the people difference, who are in the, the business run the economic I, risk? I completely agree. But the difference here between Eastman Kodak and, and digital cameras is that uh, you've had a, you know, since the days of Oliver Cromwell, the black hackney carriage trade has been regulated and governed by the state. Now, if the state is going to do that to these people, then they've got a, a duty, I think, to try and manage, well, uh, you, manage the you, transition. You can make that case. On the other hand, uh, you can also argue that they have had an unfair advantage because with the way you regulate them, they haven't had to face competition. And I don't know what the rules are in London. I don't know where it came from. But in New York, the medallions were because there were too many cabs on the streets. They weren't making any money, so they formed a group and they convinced the government to protect them and stop capitalism well, from we, working. We, we, ha we have a serious problem now, which is that, I mean, I, I totally accept it. We need, we need to let competition uh, rip. Of course we do. However, the profusion of, bla of uh, minicabs means now that we've got, I think, uh, of the uh, cars entering the congestion charge zone, the central zone in London, now uh, one in, about one in ten is a minicab because of Uber. Uh, it, two years ago, it was about one in 100. Uh, the numbers of minicabs on the streets has gone up from about 40 or 50,000 when I was elected to more than 80,000 today. But doesn't and that, that tell a, you and that, 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 that What that tells you is that's going to cause congestion. But it tells and, you and that it means demand. Well, I was going to say, it, it, the it, number it, is set by demand. It is. And that's better to let the market do it, I would argue, than government. It's also true, yeah, something else you've got to no, think no, about. Not, not, if it, not if it means that you are... You can't get to Heathrow on time. No, but it does mean instead Heathrow of me having my car on the street, I'm using the, the cars that I am using are now much more efficient because you're using them when I'm not. But there's another thing to think about here. No, it's, and it's adding, adding to traffic on the street. Well, okay. I mean, you've done a great job in certainly with traffic, with the congestion pricing, which we tried to do in New York City and couldn't, although I still, still think it's going to come back because they need more revenue and it's the logical ways to get it. But one of the things that's fascinating about Uber, and it shows you how we can share information that was never possible before. If you get into an Uber car, the, you rank the driver. You enter whether you think the driver was good or bad. Little known secret. The driver is also ranking you. So when you go on Uber and hit the get me a car button, the Uber drivers in the neighborhood see whether you're a good client or a bad client, and they rush to take care of the good clients. And I know it's strange, but that's what we all talk about. We're all in favor of everybody having all the information until we realize what that really means. All of a sudden, if you're an asshole, they're gonna, you're not going to get a cab. But that means we'll end up with a more civil society. We have to wrap this up, and I'm going to wrap it up with one question that's somewhat political. 
which involves the fact that people keep talking about you possibly becoming the next prime minister or replacing Cameron, but and likewise, people come up to you and talk to you about why don't you run for president? I'm not going to make you. That's a much more likely scenario. Answer. Boris can run That's for president. That's a much more he was born likely. in America. Uh, yes, and you have a British passport. What I'm going to ask you though is why do suddenly, never in history has it happened before, people who have been mayors are now being asked or pushed to become national leaders, something in Be- our I, I would argue happened. because you can see what mayors do. Look, mayors are responsible. If there's a body in the street, you blame the mayor. If the trash isn't picked up, you blame the mayor. If you can't breathe the air, you breathe the mayor. You blame the mayor. In many places, if this kid isn't getting educated, you blame the mayor. If you go to the national and state levels, it's much harder to see what they really do. One of our candidates for president a few years ago literally said this. I he was at the, in the Senate at the time, and he said, "I voted for the war." I think he was talking about uh, Iraq one. He said, "I voted for the war, but I didn't vote to fund it." So he's on both sides of the issues, which is like saying, my example is it's being pro-choice but not for women. Mayors can't do that. Mayors, you either do it or you don't. The press covers them because it's easy to understand and they can write stories about it. And people want want executives to make decisions. And one of the problems is we think that the head people at these governments are policy people. We we elect them because they give great speeches or they look good or whatever. The truth of the matter is you have to be able to run the railroad. The person at the top, these are executive jobs. We never look at it that way. We never measure whether they can do it. And when you get exec, when you get people in there that have no executive experience, they don't do a good job. Government stops functioning. And at least in America, we, and you have some parties springing up here that are acting strangely. It didn't happen before. We have the Tea Party on the left. We have the Bernie Sanders group on the right. They are just frustrated. Government isn't working for them. They don't know how to solve it. They don't know what they really want. It's all inconsistent. The Tea Party people say, I don't want government. Get your dirty government hands off my Medicare, one woman said. And Medicare is a government program. But, but it's the, the mayors do things. And people want. So you would at least be open to the fact people are pushing you to run for president. No, I'm not. I'm not because I couldn't win. But I, I am open to the following. Go ahead. It, who thinks sh- Mike couldn't win? You yeah. should. Come on. When, who when, thinks Mike could win? No, no, you couldn't. They do. Yeah, Come but, on. But if, if you're going to vote for somebody for president of the United States or for a party leader in the parliamentarian system. The question is, do they have any experience in doing things, in running things, in attracting people, keeping them together, getting them to work, measuring things, and if they don't work, changing things? That's what executives do. And I mean, uh, I, Mayor Johnson, having been mayor of London, does that help prepare you if you well, want to Well, I think well, I, the minister. reason historically mayors haven't made, made much of a noise in British politics is because central, we've got a very centralized system here in, in the UK. And as soon as a mayor of London uh, traditionally has got too big for his boots, the, they, they cut him down to size. And that's been the a history over the last thousand years. It happened uh, to the GLC in the 1980s. And, uh, you know, you've got to be very careful uh, of central government. I, I think my, my chances, as, as I always say, of, of, of doing whatever it was you just proposed uh, or suggested, uh, about as good as you know being blinded by a champagne cork or locked in a disused fridge or whatever the things I, I normally say. But the 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 the, the training that a mayor, being a mayor gives you is, I think, very important because you have to do things that will make you very very unpopular for a while, and it's tough. But you've got to you've got to do them. For instance. Uh, we are now putting in some absolutely beautiful cycle superhighways, and they will be totally splendid. But I have to tell the people of London, I know how furious people are about the traffic congestion along the uh, Victoria and Embankment and uh, East and, and West. It, it will get better. It will get better. But at the moment, everybody wants to see the color of my insides, particularly the, the taxi drivers. Uh, so, so, you know, you, then this, this will go on for months and months and months. And you couldn't do it in London unless you had a unless you had a mayoralty and, and a strong mayoralty. But the the, ne- the, have, end, the end result will be and good. And you have a mayor that's shown that when he or she does things in the past, they've worked because building credibility gives you an awful lot of options to do things in the future. Mayor Bloomberg, Mayor Johnson, thank you for being with us, and thank you for having us as your guests.